Hello, my darlings. Another raven here with some animal ghost stories. I'm sorry, I've had such a rough week. I can't see the summer getting any less rough in the following few weeks. But uh, I have nothing pending, so you, I'm afraid, will have to put up with what I find to read. This is from a book by Elliot O'Donnell entitled Animal Ghosts, which is very fascinating in its own right. Today, I will be starting with cats. Here is a letter about a cat. Letter four, what Kitty saw. The cook said, I wish you would come downstairs and see how strangely Kitty behaves as soon as I open the cupboard. There's nothing in it but wood. I turned it all out to see what might be the reason. Not even a mouse hole can I find. Some days previously, Cook had told me that nothing could induce Kitty to sleep in his basket. And one day he would not eat any food in the kitchen. And his meals had to be given to him outside. So I went down to please Cook. Kitty was picked up, and while Cook petted and stroked him, she knelt down and opened the cupboard. Kitty, stretching his neck and looking with big, frightened eyes into the cupboard's corner, suddenly turned around, struggling out of Cook's hold and rushing over her shoulder. He flew out of the kitchen. Getting up, Cook said, That's always what he does, just as if he was seeing something horrible. Next day, I encouraged Cook to talk to Ruff, the former black cat, which had been a great favorite of hers and which she had been nursing when he was dying. Oh, poor thing. When he was ill, he would creep into dark corners, so I put him in his basket into the cupboard, making it very comfortable for him, and there he died, pointing to the very corner which had caused such horror to Kitty. Captain Humphrey's Story A Materialized Cat My son had the following experience at the age of four years, in our Worcestershire home. He was an only child and spent much of his time in the company of a cat who shared his tastes and pursuits, even to the extent of fishing in the weir with him, the cat being far more proficient at the sport than the boy. When the cat died, we, none of us, dared to break the news to the child and were much surprised when he asked us to say why his cat only came to play with him at nights nowadays. When we questioned him about it, he stoutly maintained that his cat was there, in bodily form, every night after he went to bed, looking much the same but a little thinner. At about the same age, one evening after being in bed one hour, I heard him cry out, and going upstairs, his maid also heard and ran up and asked him what was the matter. He said that an old gentleman with a long gray beard, like his grandfather, came into his room and stood at the front of his bed. At the very moment, the former had had a seizure in his carriage while driving through the streets of Birmingham, from which he had died without regaining consciousness. Later, on recognizing a photograph of his grandfather as being the person he saw at the foot of his bed, my wife, the maid, and myself can vouch for the accuracy of these statements. Also, friends to whom we have related these facts, Mrs. E. J. Ellis's story, The Old Woman's Cat. My wife, writes Mr. Ellis, who was brought up in Germany, and who was not sufficiently confident about her English to attempt to put down anything for publication in that language, tells me the following story for the Occult Review. When I was a little girl living with my family near Michaelstadt in Odenwald, I remember an old woman, like an old witch, 
whose name was Louise, and who was called Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer Louise, because she exhibited pipes for sale in her cottage window, along with the cheap dress stuffs, needles and threads, and simple toys for children, which were her stock in trade. She had a favorite cat, which was devoted to her, but its attachment doesn't seem to have been enough to make her happy, for she married a young sergeant named Lautenschlager, who might have been her son, or indeed her grandson, and who, as everyone said, courted her for her money. She died as long ago as 1869, and during her last illness, the devoted cat was always with her. It kept watch beside the body when she was dead and refused to be driven away. In a fit of exasperation, Lautenschlager seized it, carried it off, and drowned it in the little river mumbling at a place where the road from Michaelstadt to the neighboring village Steinbach runs near the water's edge. It was bordered with poplars then, but chestnut trees shade it now. Why that was important, I can't say. Soon after his first wife was buried, Lautenschlager married again and opened an eating house in Steinbach, where he established his second wife. He had a sister whom he placed in the cottage for poor Pfeiffer Louise. She carried on the business, and every day Lautenschlager used to walk over from Steinbach to see how she was getting on, returning in the evening to his wife, who used to relate to my mother that he frequently came home terrified and bathed in perspiration. For as he passed the place where he had drowned the cat, its ghost used to come out of the river and run beside him along the dark road, sometimes terrifying him still more by jumping in front of him. After a few years of married life, the second wife died, and Lautenschlager married a third. That's getting suspicious. A little cottage business had prospered, and in its place he now had a considerable draper shop in Middlest in Mekelstad. He continued to walk over from Steinbach, where now the third wife lived in the eating house, and the ghost of the cat continued to frighten him by appearing at nightfall as he walked beside the river. I can remember hearing his third wife describe his dread of it, and my mother has told me how both the sister and the second wife used to say the same thing, though I was too young then for them to tell me about it. Lautenschlager used also to complain to the country people who came to dine at his eating house. He considered himself an ill-used man and felt that the supernatural powers were treating him very hardly and subjecting him to real persecution. I have only the conversation of his wife and the gossip of the village to vouch for his sincerity, and the genuineness of the apparition is supported only by Lautenschlager's word. But his evident anger and agitation were accepted as genuine, and no one dreamed of doubting his word. He was not at all a dreamy or an imaginative man, and did not drink. His passion was merely momentary. He was not only a draper and a caterer, but a usurer and realized something of a fortune by lending money on good security to peasants and farmers who, it was said, did not consider how they bound themselves when they signed the papers he put before them. Lautenschleiger continued to be haunted by the cat ghost at irregular intervals for more than 20 years and it made a marked change in his character. He became serious, and during the latter part of his life, would only talk about religion and read sacred literature. He died about 10 years ago. Hmm, that was something to say about Lautenschlecker. I hope he did find religion, because he was not, it seems, a very good man who would drown the cat. All right, this next one is about a fox terrier. Two or three years ago, I visited a medium, Mrs. Davies of 44 Labrum Grove, 
Portsmouth. I had been seated only a few minutes when a little pug dog of hers looked up in, my, in the direction of my knees and down towards my feet, growling and howling in a most strange manner. What on earth is he looking at? I exclaimed. Oh, said the medium, there's a little fox terrier lying across your feet. One half of his face is quite dark and the other half white, but he has such a peculiar black patch over the eye that one would almost think it was a black bruise. Now, sir, I had such a little dog in India, but this lady did not know of him and would never have known had he not, as I afterwards found, died out there. This is not only a case of the appearance of an animal after death, but also a case in which it was seen by another animal, as also by the medium. I am also told that the pug dog, who had this vision of my dog, was once seen to pounce upon what seemed to the medium to be several cats near the copper in the scullery of the same house. The medium asked a neighbor if the previous occupants had any cats. Oh, yes, replied the neighbor and badly the poor things were served, for they were cruelly thrown into the copper, which was full of boiling water. Oh. So much animal cruelty. Some five years ago, we had a puppy, about six months old. I used to train him to always go around the back way to come into the house. One day he got hurt and run over, being instantly killed by a streetcar. A day or two after the accident, I was going in my front door, and I saw the dog go up the steps in front of me as plainly as I ever saw him in my life. It seemed he knew that I had taught him he must not go in the front way, because he would go a few steps and then turn around and look at me, as though he wanted to see how I was taking it and I positively saw him go to the full length of the hall, into the house a distance of about twenty feet before he disappeared. I saw him do this at least three times in two months that we stayed in that flat. I told at least a half a dozen people of the incident at the time it happened, and I can vouch for its authenticity. I remain yours truly, Jilton. Well, my darlings, I hope you've enjoyed this small little video. This was, of course, about over a hundred years old, being from 1913. And we will move on to other animals at another time. I find the concept of animal ghosts so interesting that leads to such questions as souls and whether animals have them. So quoth this raven. And I will see you next time, my darlings, under the trees.